Canadian football is a magic show, a century-old spectacle, grown men battling to cross a line drawn in the dirt. It is a game filled with heroes, great players and great teams, bringing championship pride to their faithful fans. The field is a battleground where skill and determination are the tools of the trade. It is a game that has grabbed the nation by the heart. An annual struggle becomes an epic battle as teams fight for the ultimate glory. The chance to hold the Grey Cup and become forever known as a champion. Canadian football was born in the mid-1800s, a child of rugby reshaped by robust young men off on a new world adventure. The version they devised, rougher, tougher, bloodier, found a home on university athletic fields where the student body became the game's first fans. But this wonderful new game was strictly a Canadian phenomenon until a fateful weekend in 1874 when the men of McGill University accepted an invitation to play two matches at Harvard and found the Americans playing a different game entirely, an offshoot of soccer containing little of the rough and tumble chaos now so dear to the Canadians' hearts. They played one game under the Canadian rules, under McGill's rules, one game under the uh, Harvard rules, in the end, Harvard enjoyed the type of football that McGill brought so much that they rode away to rugby school in England and they got the official rugby rules. The game of the North was now a cross-border phenomenon. Soon, it spilled over the campuses and into the cities, then west with the settlers. No longer merely the sport of the educated elite, it became the game of the working masses. Teams sprang out of meetings held in rooms over grocery stores, in mechanics halls and rowing clubs. Bankers bashed iron workers. Lawyers took their lumps from lumberjacks. Leagues were born, collapsed, and rose again. A new country had a new game and new heroes. By the turn of the century, football had been embraced by athletes of all ages and from all walks of life, competing for trophies of every shape and size. In 1909, word of this new game caught the attention of Albert Henry George Gray, the fourth Earl Gray and the Governor General of Canada. Well-known patrons of Canadian arts, the Earl and his wife decided that the new game should have a true national championship. At a cost of $48, Lord Grey provided a simple silver trophy that would one day be the stuff of dreams, the Grey Cup. The cup was donated by uh, the Governor General, uh, Lord Earl Grey, who probably never saw a game played. Uh, he put up the trophy for the Amateur Football Championship of Canada, and people who were playing football in all parts of Canada saw it as emblematic of the national championship. The first Grey Cup game was held on a chilly December Saturday in 1909. 3,800 fans made the trek to Rosedale Field to watch the University of Toronto defeat the Parkdale Canoe Club in what was rather grandly called the Canadian Championship. But Lord Grey's trophy wasn't there. Someone had forgotten to have it engraved. The games then were simple gatherings young and not-so-young athletes out for a rough-and-tumble afternoon. 
But soon, Earl Grey's Cup was more than just another trophy. As the decades passed and the number of challengers grew, it would become the new game's Holy Grail. In the 1940s, not even a world in conflict could halt the yearly quest. When Canada went to war, enlisted men formed teams and battled for the cup under military banners. Through rain, fog, mud, or the chill of Canadian winter, the cup chase never faltered. Now, the pursuers wanted more than the championship. They wanted that magical, matchless moment when they could grasp Earl Grey's cup and triumphantly hold it high. When you win the Grey Cup, you know, you're, you're on such a high because you've accomplished what nine teams start out to do and only one does. What it meant to the city of Winnipeg and the fans, uh, that's when it starts sinking in uh, of just how important the Grey Cup is and what it means to the people of Canada. It really didn't hit you till a few days later and you, you know, when you get back in Edmonton and you're going to the parade and say, hey, this is kind of a big deal. The city of Vancouver, on our uh, return, just opened their arms to us. A marvelous thing and very special. There was love here for the BC Lions. 20 below weather, the streets were lined all the way from the airport entrance to City Hall where they took us back to on buses and the town just went nuts. Every team sets out and you want to win the championship. Win the championship, that is a successful season. Anything else isn't successful. It didn't really hit me at the, after the game. It hit me the next year, seeing that this trophy is gonna be forever. Your name's gonna be a part of it and you're gonna be associated with a great cup winning team. Canadian football's eastern roots gave this rugged game at least a touch of refinement. Out west, settlers toughened by hardship and prairie winters reveled in their own bone-crushing version, fought with a ferocity and abandon that turned a simple game into a no-quarter battle. They just threw money into the pot, and the first one that drew blood uh, got the money. Uh, there were a lot of broken bones and uh, broken noses and front teeth missing and that kind of thing. In the uh, first game, Regina played against Saskatoon. Up in Saskatoon, the uh, police chief was so upset with the fact that the uh, Regina team was winning and he thought they were playing too rough against the Saskatoon boys that he came on the field and had the Regina team arrested. In spite of the potential for injury or arrest, football thrived on the Canadian prairie. The Hamilton Tigers became the first team to journey west, playing exhibition games in Winnipeg, Moose Jaw, Regina, and Calgary. While Eastern teams were happy to share the game with the West, sharing their championship trophy was another matter. Only Eastern teams were, would play for the Grey Cup. And in 1911, the Calgary Tigers won the, the championship of the West and they challenged. They wanted to play in the Grey Cup. And the CRU wouldn't let them. They, they would first turn them down. They said, you didn't play in the East, you, you can't play challenge for the Grey Cup. Finally, with great reluctance, the Edmonton Eskimos were allowed to come east in 1921 to challenge Toronto for the right to sip from the Earl's silvered mug. Their timing couldn't have been worse. They ran head-on to the man known as the Big Train, Lionel Conacher. They ended up losing 23 to nothing in that game. Conacher, as a matter of fact, uh, scored 15 points and uh, halfway through the third quarter had to lead because he had a hockey game that night. Hockey and football were just two of the many sports on the Conacher resume. All played so brilliantly that he was named Canada's athlete of the half century. Since 1921, Western teams had marched east for the Grey Cup game, only to fall to the Eastern football powerhouses. In desperation, they cast their eyes not to the heavens, but to the south. 
We didn't have the population in the West that uh, they had in the East, so in order to get enough guys, uh, you know, it was, uh, we had to supplement them with uh, good, uh, experienced American players from American colleges. And uh, of course, the first su most successful of those teams was the Winnipeg team in 1935. Winnipeg coach Joe Ryan took a fishing trip to Minnesota and North Dakota that fateful summer of 1935. His bait, money, and he landed his limit. For $7,400, he came home with nine imports, including the West's first superstar, the incomparable Fritzy Hansen. With Fritzy carrying the mail, the Bombers romped through the West and into the Grey Cup game, where on a muddy field in Hamilton, stunned Easterners got their first look at the little big man from Minnesota. Fritzy Hansen was an import that, for Winnipeg, and he was one of these scatbacks that could dangle, and he caught a couple of kicks and ran right through the whole team because nobody had any traction. He had the whole field to himself, and he made the game look easy for Winnipeg, and he made a great name for himself. In Fritzy and Friends, the Canadian Rugby Union did not see players of great skill. They saw a threat to the very game itself, with teams buying championships and Americans shoving local boys off the roster. Their solution changed the rules. The CRU decided that uh, they didn't want these American imports coming in uh, specifically to win a competition. So they passed what was called a, a one-year residency rule. And they said that any American playing in the Grey Cup game had to be in the country for at least one year prior to the game. American imports were now a fact of Canadian football life. Although their numbers increased with the years, they did not destroy the game as the CRU had so darkly predicted. They enhanced it. The Northern League thrived, an alliance that continues to bring great American players to a game that remains distinctly Canadian. There's something about the Canadian Football League in Canada. It's got a tremendous uh, history about it when you go back and look at some of the great people that have come up here and lived in this country and they got the opportunity to play. I mean, this is what the game's all about. It was an opportunity that I was being given that I didn't see happening in my own country. And I really weighed the pros and cons of going to Canada or staying in the United States. And I chose to go to Canada because they were giving me a realistic opportunity to play the game that I love. I wanted to come play. And in the NFL, they would have just used me for, you know, okay for this and for that. And in Edmonton, I knew I had a chance to do what I wanted to do and play the game. It put the fun back in football for me. It enabled me to go back out, just be an athlete, play football, and enjoy it. And I'll be forever grateful for that. During the Depression, there was seldom a penny to spare for children's games. But kids who longed to play football could always find a way. Nobody had a football, so we'd take somebody's cap, you know the old caps that the kids used to wear, you'll see them in pictures, and stuff it with uh, padding, and we, so we have no kicking game, so it's a running game only. And uh, that's how we got started. All our footballs were homemade. We couldn't afford a football. Well, I had some made like a football, made out of a sack or some stuff, sack or a pig's bladder or something like that. But the only time that I ever touched a real football is when I went to uh, high school. But young boys become young men, and there are real footballs to be thrown and real games to be played. As a pastime becomes a passion, a game becomes a way of life. Though the stakes grow higher and the wins more important, it all comes down to a simple love of the game. Canadian football was plain, old-fashioned mayhem. You played it, in my day, you played it because you loved the game. The players didn't make any money, they, uh, and so they all held jobs. Stukas worked for the star. And uh, as a football writer, while at the time he was playing, which he certainly gave himself the benefit of the doubt in his stories, 
The Stukas tells the story of playing for the Argonauts when they won the Grey Cup, I think it was 1938, and uh, all he got for it was a windbreaker. Uh, he says a really nice windbreaker. Though the players weren't making any money, they could see by the crowds paying their way into the parks that someone was. They decided it was time they got a piece of the pie. The man the Toronto Argonauts picked to plead their case, Anna Stukas. Management was quick to respond. How dare this goddamn football player ask for money? We let him play. We give him great uniforms. We go to the best hotels when we go out of towns. Holy mackerel, and now the guy wants money? Playing football in Canada was an uncertain profession at best, but the harsh Canadian winter was a virtual guarantee. I used to die in the cold uh, because you have the lighter uniforms on, so every time you hit the ground, you took a chunk out of your hide. You literally did take a chunk out of your body. And the, the, the most painful thing I had to do that day was take a shower. It was so painful to, to get in that water. In our first game, the referee had to stand under the goalpost. It was snowing so hard to see if the ball was going through on field goals and extra points. And I said, what did I get myself into here? I'm cold. Football was a daylight game. If dusk fell before the final gun, finishing the contest required a little help from the crowd. Fans were urged to park their cars along the sidelines because if the game got going too long, then uh, what would happen was that they'd turn the lights on and, from their cars and, uh, and, and play it out that particular way. We were playing a game in Ottawa, and we played the last 10 minutes of that game or five minutes of that game uh, under headlights. They, they got the people to turn their headlights on in the car. And that's how we finished the game. By the 1930s, football had been in Canada for better than a half century, and still the game looked a lot like rugby. The forward pass had found its way into the rule book, but not everyone cared or dared to use it. The kicking was the essence of the game. What the guys did is that they punted the ball and then ran down underneath it. As the forward pass came in, in 19, around 1930, there were different rules. For example, if a pass was incomplete, it was a fumble. And so uh, it was used very judiciously. The man who changed all that was Warren Stevens. In 1931, he threw the Grey Cup's first touchdown pass in Montreal's 22-0 win over Regina. But change requires time. While the forward pass could be a quick and devastating weapon when successful, throwing the ball was still no simple matter. To be honest with you, we, we didn't throw that many passes as, as they do today. The, the darn balls, they were almost like, almost like a soccer ball. It was very difficult to, to grab a hold of the darn thing, so you just you laid it on the palm of your hand and threw it. In other words, you didn't grip it. Well, the ball we used was relatively primitive because it wasn't dimpled to enable the quarterback to grasp it easier. And when I look at it, I, you know, I can't believe the, the size and the shape compared to how it is today. Pass, run, or kick, the name of the game was hitting, and the padding offered little protection. The equipment I used, uh, people would laugh at. What you got when you went up with the big team was secondhand furniture. The training camp, the, the new guys coming in took old-timers' equipment from a year, two years past. And if the shoes were a size too big, Tough luck, wear them. The post-war years were a boom time for Canadian football. In 1948, 
the Calgary Stampeders galloped through the three-team West as they recorded the only undefeated season in league history. Heading east, the four-day train trip became a traveling party as the Stampeders made the cross-country trek to the Grey Cup game. Arriving with Stetson-topped fans, Indian chiefs, chuck wagons, and horses, the Stampeders didn't just come from the West, they brought the West with them. The 1948 Great Cup game was pivotal in uh, turning a celebration into a national festival. The Calgary Stampeders brought their chuck wagons, loaded them on the train, uh, they had flapjack breakfasts, they had horses parading through hotel lobbies. It gave it another dimension and uh, from that time on I think almost every Great Cup game has been measured by what happened in 1948. The Stampeders did more than defeat the Ottawa Rough Riders 12-7. Their victory and their fans' western exuberance turned a three-hour showdown into a week-long hoedown, and the party has never stopped. Grey Cup Day has become Grey Cup Week, a game once of regional interest is now a national obsession. And so, the story of the modern-day CFL begins. It is the story of a league often battered but never down of a game that is an important thread in the Canadian cultural fabric, a game that is ours and ours alone. Canadian football is, is something I was brought up on. I love the game because it's quick. It, it has always allowed the quarterback to be able to run with the ball, and I thoroughly enjoyed that challenge. The excitement in the game in a Canadian football game with the three downs, with the wider field, with the kick return. It may be the best game in the world to watch on television. It's so fast, it's so wide open, and it, I, I think it, it speaks to my personality. It's sort of a living on the edge type of football game. It's exciting. You're never out of a ball game in the Canadian Football League. And as a quarterback, that's all you want is a chance. You want to have the ball in your hands with one minute to play and give your team a chance to win the ball game. The Canadian Football League is arguably the most significant cultural institution in the country as it relates to bringing cities across the country together. It's the one thing, the one professional sport that we have left that we can say is purely Canadian. It's the only one. Canadian football is a magic show, a century-old spectacle, grown men battling to cross a line drawn in the dirt. It is a game filled with heroes, great players and great teams, bringing championship pride to their faithful fans. The field is a battleground where skill and determination are the tools of the trade. It is a game that has grabbed the nation by the heart an annual struggle becomes an epic battle as teams fight for the ultimate glory. The chance to hold the Grey Cup and become forever known as a champion.
Toronto has long been a home to Canadian football. In 1873, the Argonaut Rowing Club decided that the new game was a perfect way to keep their rowers in top condition. In 1909, the University of Toronto captured the first ever Grey Cup championship. The Argonauts earned their first Grey Cup in 1914, and their 1921 victory featured the game's first superstar, Lionel Big Train Conacher. The colorful Annis Stukas led the Argos to back-to-back -back championships in 1937 and 38. And Toronto continued to dominate the game through the 40s, led by a one-two punch known as the Gold Dust Twins. The Gold Dust Twins, of course, were the great Royal Copeland and Joe Kroll. In those days, they played a single wing, and Joe was the tailback. He took the ball from center and he either ran with it or handed it off or threw it. And his receiver was Royal Copeland, who was a magnificent running back. And uh, that was their big weapon, Joe throwing the ball to Royal Copeland. Royal Copeland, in my opinion, was one of the greatest running backs in Canadian football. Uh, he not only had speed, but he was a very deceptive runner. Gee, uh, uh, I, I can't honestly remember anybody really hitting him solidly. So he was just a great all-around ball player. Beginning in 1945, the combination of Kroll and Copeland led the powerful Toronto offense as the Argos captured three consecutive Grey Cup championships. But no game in Argo history will ever top the 1950 final against Winnipeg, the infamous Mud Bowl. The Mud Bowl game was one of the great disasters in the CFL. What happened, of course, is that we had a sudden uh, snowstorm on the night before the game, and then it started to melt. And what we ended up with was slush, basically, and water, and it was the most deplorable conditions that you could ever think of. We had a quarterback by the name of Al Dechterbrum, and what he would do would get thumbtacks. He'd file them down, and then he would tape them to his fingers, obviously with the points sticking out. It was wet and cold and muddy, and yet Dechterbrun was handling the ball like, like it was a, a dry day. He was very effective. He was able to throw the football, not for any distance, but he could throw short passes, and that was all the Argonauts needed to control the play. And the Argos were able to win it, uh, mainly because they did it on their kicking. And of course, their punter that day was Joe Kroll, I was the only guy that had a, a clean uniform because obviously all I did was go in and kick the ball and I came off the field again. Unfortunately, on one of the plays, the snap was bad and I had to pick the darn thing up and run with it. 25, down the 20, down to the 15 yard line for Joe Kroll around the left end. We made a first down, but uh, even, even my own teammates had great delight in, in seeing me fall down in the mud. In 1952, Toronto was again the top team in the game. Running back Ulysses Curtis shattered Lionel Conacher's team rushing record. And in the Grey Cup, quarterback Nobby Workowski led the team to a 21-11 victory over the Edmonton Eskimos. For the remainder of the 50s, the Argos struggled. But as a new decade began, Toronto fans found hope. In 61, the Eastern Final, the Argonauts went into Hamilton to play the Tiger Cats. They, it was a two-game total point series they had in those days. They'd won the game in Toronto by 18 points. They went into Hamilton. It seemed no way they could lose. Somehow we, we scored uh, enough to, uh, to tie the ball game late in the game. We went into uh, two overtimes and uh, beat them by four touchdowns. The team defensively and offensively just really clicked. While the Argos saw little success, fan favorite Dick Shadow remained one of the top players in the game. After 12 highlight field seasons, he retired with CFL records for both receptions and touchdowns. From 1962 to 66, the Argos recorded five consecutive last place finishes. Looking for leadership, the team recruited Toronto Rifles coach, Leo Cahill. My first year with the Argonauts was a scary year. We had some guys on that football team that uh, were real characters and uh, coach killers. 
I, I got rid of a couple of those guys in a hurry and, and uh, started building from there. And uh, I think they started getting the idea that uh, there was going to be no nonsense on the football team. A 1967 trade with the BC Lions brought Coach K. Hill a tough running back who could do it all, Bill Simons. Bill Simons was one of the finest guys that I ever coached. And uh, to go along with that, he was just a great football player. He was a National Football League type back. He was big, he was strong, he could catch the ball, and he could run. He had some great years for us. When I came to Toronto in 67, I was playing, we had started building a team that was all character. Most of the guys had come from some other team and had been traded, and we kind of put a bunch of renegades together. And Leo was good at uh, that, at molding, uh, molding a bunch of guys. And we started believing in ourselves that we, could, we were going to win. Among the new recruits, running back Leon McQuay, defensive end Jim Corrigal, and the quarterback people told Cahill he'd never get, Notre Dame's Joe Theismann. Leo Cahill was one of the great recruiters. He could talk people into almost anything. He, uh, Joe Theismann came, uh, was going to go with the Miami Dolphins. Leo brought him to Toronto, sat down and convinced Joe that he should play with the Argonauts. They had a big press conference in Southern Florida and uh, uh, Joe pretty well agreed that he was going to go with the Miami Dolphins. And when I heard this, it was on the wire and in the newspapers, I picked up the phone and I called him and I said, Joe, you really uh, deserve to speak with us again and maybe we can come to some conclusions. He came up and we signed a contract. In 1971, Joe Theismann and the Toronto Argonauts were in the Grey Cup. Late in the game, Toronto trailed the Calgary Stampeders by three. With a chance to set up a tying field goal, Coach Cahill called a handoff to Leon McQuay. So Leon got the ball and swept to his left and uh, when he, when he got about to look at the off-tackle play to his left, it opened up like a suitcase, and he planted his outside foot, and his feet went out from under him. That was a very wet field. When Leon slipped, his elbow hit the ground and bounced the ball out, and it was just one of those circumstances. Now, the rule, as far as football is concerned, is that the ground can't make you fumble, but under the circumstances, the referees called it the other way. The fumble ended Toronto's Grey Cup dream. But as the Stampeders celebrated, Leo Cahill felt certain that things were looking up. 71, I was coach of the year, and I said to myself, uh, 72, we're gonna win it all. And then we had seven injuries of starters on that football team, didn't make the playoffs, and I was called in and fired. Leo Cahill is always gonna have a controversy around him. He spoke his piece, he loved the media. He always had uh, something to say, the press loved him. And I think if he did bring uh, a great amount of interest to the Toronto Argonauts. Over the next 10 years, the Argos would see eight head coaches and eight last place finishes. A 1981 trade with Ottawa brought quarterback Conrich Holloway to Toronto. The team won only twice that season, but Holloway remained confident. Going to Toronto was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I got a chance to be thrown in the fire and either sink or swim. And I held my guns there and decided I was going to stick it out. And I, I felt that we could turn that team around. Kyridge Holloway was one of the toughest players I ever coached or, or ever saw compete because Kyridge would rather get hit than throw an interception. He was just a tough, gutty guy that, uh, you know, he would lay it all on the line to win. In 1982, head coach Bob Obilovich installed a high-speed pass-oriented offense known as the run and shoot. In a single season, the Toronto Argonauts climbed from worst to first. We had a high percentage of completions. We gave the defenses a lot of problems. And it caused the defenses to become more creative, too. They, they had to deal with this now more than ever before. Uh, there were some major adjustments with the defenses once we started showing what we could do with that offense. They always isolated Terry Greer. And I don't think anybody at that time, when he was playing at his best, could cover this receiver. And the run and shoot all came off of him because you had to adjust your defense to stop him. So. If you had to put two men out on Terry Greer, you were playing one man short against that offense. Last play of the game, ball's in the air, 
game's on the line. There's only one guy that I want going up for that ball for me. That's Terry Greer. And he's going to catch it, and he's going to score. In 1982, Conridge, Holloway, and the Toronto Argonauts faced the Edmonton Eskimos in the Grey Cup. Although the Argos would fall to the Eskimos, their fans felt the moment worthy of celebration. I bet you that's the only team that ever played in the Grey Cup that didn't win the Grey Cup that got a downtown parade. We had about 25,000 people downtown, and I remember telling the players after that parade, you can imagine what this is going to be like if we ever win the Grey Cup. The following year, the Argos got their chance. In Vancouver's BC Play Stadium, the hometown Lions got off to a strong start. As Holloway struggled against the powerful Lions defense, Toronto fell behind. BC was up the first half. And, uh, you know, I had a little bout with the flu, but I don't think I was playing that well. And Coach Abilovich made a switch. Joe Barnes came in and played exceptional. Uh, won the most valuable player trophy, and we won the Grey Cup. And, uh, I think uh, it's just a total team effort and so many people contribute, but you know, Joe coming in and playing, probably the biggest contribution. 1983 marked the Argos' first Grey Cup victory in 31 years. Four years later, the team had another chance at a championship, but the play Coach Abilovich will always remember is a 115-yard return by Edmonton's Gizmo Williams. As a coach, that's the closest I've ever been to tackling a player on the field. <laughs> when Gizmo went past the bench, I knew we were in trouble, and I was tempted. I really was, and I, I could see what was happening. Uh, that 87 Grey Cup game that we lost was all because of special teams, poor play on special teams, or good play by them, however you want to look at it. Soon, Bob Obilovich and the Toronto Argonauts would have a game breaker of their own. Five foot six speedster, Michael Clemens. We were at training camp the first year we had him there, and we were running short yardage plays, and he was running out of the tailback spot. And he went into the line, he bounced here and bounced over there, here, and, and I laughed, and he kept going. <laughs> I said, that guy's like a pinball out there. I went for 24 years without a nickname. I was here a week, and Coach Bob Obilovich made a statement to the media that we have this new guy that bounces around like a pinball, and it stuck. Mike was playing, he was on the highlight film. You know, you look at the returners and the guys that are punt returning, kickoff returning, playing receiver, playing running back, accumulating all purpose yards in the league today. And then you pull out a tape and watch pinball and what he did when he was playing, it's not even close. Just like a top hitting the side of a, you know, of a cabinet or something, just bouncing off and just spinning down the field. That's the way pinball was. 1991 brought a new head coach, Adam Rita and new ownership. The Argos went showbiz as Bruce McNall, Wayne Gretzky, and John Candy shook up the city. People were genuinely excited about the Canadian Football League in Toronto. You had 50,000 people at, uh, at the home opener. I remember the Blues Brothers were performing at halftime. There was a real excitement about the, um, about the football team. And of course, the focal point of that excitement was the signing of Rocket Ishmael from Notre Dame. Signing Heisman Trophy winner Ishmael cost the Argos new ownership millions. But when he took to the field, it looked like money well spent. He was an exciting player. Every time he touched the ball, it could have been six. It felt like that when he, when he had the ball, because I don't think I've ever seen a guy that was so fast. He just had unreal speed. Some guys are real fast when they don't have equipment on. You know, you can run a good 40 times. But football speed is different, you know, when you got the equipment on. And, and so he had great football speed. In 1991, the year of the rocket, um, Bruce McNall, John Candy, Wayne Gretzky, the whole Toronto Argonaut euphoric ex experience was, was just a joy ride. It turned out to be one of the most extraordinary football seasons, I think, in the history of the CFL. After capturing the Eastern Final, Toronto headed to the Grey Cup game. But a dark cloud hung over the Argos. A shoulder problem made Matt Dunnigan a doubtful starter. 
there were really a lot of questions about whether Matt Dunigan would play because of a sore shoulder he had. He was very coy that entire week about whether he was going to play or not. But the Argos the day before the game took him into the hotel, uh, the hotel they were staying at, took him into a, a ballroom and uh, had him throw there. And that's when the decision was made that he was uh, fit enough to play. I felt like I'd played long enough. If I screwed my shoulder up to the point where I couldn't play again, then I felt at that point it was worth it. You know, I'd given it my best shot. And um, who knows if you're ever going to get back to the Great Cup. Facing the Calgary Stampeders, Dunnigan put on one of the grittiest performances in Grey Cup history as the Argos defeated Calgary 36-21. For Dunnigan, the victory made it all worthwhile. The pain after the game, uh, yeah, yeah, it hurt, you know. You know, it didn't matter at that point. It won the pinnacle. It won the Grey Cup. After the 1991 Grey Cup, Toronto sank to the bottom of the East. In 1996, coach Don Matthews arrived, hoping to right the ship. Don Matthews understands how to win. Right? Uh, probably the best coach uh, I've ever played under. I think simply said he knows how he wants to play the game and he's very good at surrounding himself with the right personnel in order to do that. I believe that I teach the players to expect to win, and that's one of our attitudes. So every time that we go on the football field, I want my football team to have the attitude that we expect to win. We don't hope to win, and we don't think we can win, but we expect to win. Matthews found a quarterback who knew how to win, Doug Flutie. And to put together the game plan, he recruited former Argos head coach, Adam Rita. When I went to Toronto, Adam Reed was the offensive coordinator, and Adam basically put in a couple of things early in the beginning of camp, and then after that said, you know, whatever you want to do, we'll do it. I was at a point in my career where I really understood this game, and I basically implemented my own offense and the things that I wanted to run and called my own plays and just went out and had fun. Doug Flutie made us feel as a team, anytime we stepped on the field, we were going to win the football game. Didn't matter what point in the football game it was, didn't matter how many points we were up or down, because Doug Flutie was the quarterback, we were going to win. In 1996, on a snowbound field in Hamilton's Iverwind Stadium, the Edmonton Eskimos and the Toronto Argonauts prepared to battle for the championship of the CFL. The 96 Grey Cup was Canadian Football League at its best. It was snowing. They were plowing the sidelines. It was one of those classic Canadian winter days. It did not feel cold. I don't know what the temperature was that day, but the snow just kept piling up, and the snow was piling up in a hurry, and it be, traction became a definite problem. I couldn't stand up. The footing was challenging, if you will, and, and in that kind of game, you expect that you're going to have a defensive battle. It was one of the great games as far as scoring. No matter what the conditions were, uh, balls were going to the right individuals, uh, guys were returning kicks, uh, field goals were going through it. The elements had played no part in that game. It was just a, a great football game under some pretty tough conditions. Eddie Downtown Brown made the greatest single game catch I have ever seen. In the first quarter, he caught a, uh, a bomb pass. It went through his hands, hit his knee, then hit his foot, came back up, he grabbed it in his hands, and ran into the end zone untouched for the touchdown. Offense was the name of the game as both teams managed to overcome the elements. In one of the most thrilling Grey Cup showdowns in CFL history, the Toronto Argonauts recorded a 43-37 victory over the Edmonton Eskimos. For as bad as the weather was, as far as the snow and the slipperiness went, that was one heck of a football game. But we couldn't stop them, and they had a heck of a time stopping us. When you look at it from a fan standpoint, it had to be a great game to watch, and uh, it had a lot of excitement for everybody, and that's what the game should be about. The following year, Toronto was back in the Grey Cup. The Western champion Saskatchewan Rough Riders were no match for Flutie and the Argonauts and Toronto romped to a 47-23 victory, their first back-to-back -back championships in 50 years. 
I think we were the uh, heavy favorite going into the game, and, and with the season that we had, a 15-3 and three regular season record, I think we had a little bit too much team for Saskatchewan that day, and I think the score indicated that. The only thing that is tougher than winning a Grey Cup is repeating. And so the 97 year, there was a, a, a level of appreciation of what it's like, not just to get to the, the top level, not just to be the best, but to stay there. We had two great seasons back to back, a lot of fun. We had loyal fans that were there week in and week out that had a blast with us, enjoyed the ride to win them back to back Grey Cubs. We just had a lot of fun. In 2000, his 12th season with the team, fan favorite Pinball Clemens made the move from player to coach. Two years later, he added president to his title. In the 130 year history of the Toronto Argonauts, one thing has remained true, the passion for the Canadian game. The Grey Cup, our, our title game, right, is still the biggest event that happens in Canada on a yearly basis. And the Canadian Football League is arguably the most significant cultural institution in the country as it relates to bringing cities across the country together. I think that says it all. The Hamilton-Toronto rivalry is as big now as it ever was. The, uh, the biggest crowd they get every year in Hamilton is Labor Day when they play the Argonauts. And it doesn't matter whether the Argonauts have a good team or a bad team, they still sell out to Ivor Wynn Stadium for that game. And uh, of course one reason is, uh, a lot of reasons, they're so close to each other. You know, the two cities are uh, 50 miles apart. And secondly, uh, people in Hamilton resent Toronto. Toronto being the big sophisticated city, you know, with the uh, stockbrokers and the skyscrapers and everything, and Hamilton has the, is a steel town, a working man's town. As an Argo, they tell you that in order to come into the country, you got to hate the Thai cats. Otherwise, we're not going to let you across this border. And, and uh, it, it, it's, it's such, uh, it, it's unexplainable how it carries on, how the, people don't talk about it. They don't say, hey, listen, you know, we, we don't like Hamilton, right? It, it just, it is just natural. And nothing symbolizes it more. We love when, when Hamilton comes to Toronto, right? But no, nothing symbolizes it more than Labor Day down in Hamilton and the fans being right on top of you, it seems. The fans that just, if you wore double blue, they're ready to drop and fight you right then and there, both sides. They have some tough fans over there too, but I'd say that we've won most of the battles. I can remember going to Hamilton and, and winning a game over there and coming out of the dressing room and having one guy, have a guy up against the, the wire fence uh, three feet off the ground and was, uh, in a chokehold and, uh, and, and guys swinging at us and doing all kind of things when we were getting off the bus. and uh, uh, That never happened in Ottawa. It never happened even in Montreal. Or, and it certainly didn't happen out west. People out west were much more civilized. But uh, when you went into Hamilton, uh, you had to take your steel hot helmet with you and uh, make sure that uh, you kept your feet on the ground. Those weren't football games. Those were wars. Uh, Ham Toronto didn't have the greatest football team, but boy, they gave us some of the toughest times we've ever had physically with anybody because I think they wanted to beat us so bad because we had that reputation of being steel tough, and those were wars, I'll tell you. It, I mean, it is 60 minutes of organized violence. The two teams just go at each other, and it really doesn't matter what the records are. 
you know, it doesn't matter, you know, if one team is doing really well and the other team is not doing so well or both teams are competitive. or it, it, the, the, You can throw all the records out the window when you get to the Toronto-Hamilton game. It is a game in which guys play with every ounce of who they are because they know what's on the line. Most of them were close, hard-fought games, and I remember... Uh, I especially remember the away games more than the home games. It's just the fact that we used to play in the old CNE Stadium in Toronto and just having to get tickets for my family and friends in Toronto. They used to shove all the Hamilton people over into the one corner of the stadium, the far end of the stadium where the wind, especially in October and November, would blow the hardest. And, you know, it, it was just a, a great atmosphere. And even Toronto back then was selling out. We were getting sell out crowds and every Toronto Hamilton game is like almost a mini Grey Cup. The Stukas brothers were absolutely two opposites and uh, that's why it was fun to play for both of them, uh, have a triad. Uh, Bill was a quarter, they're both quarterbacks. Bill worked it by the book perfection. He was a perfectionist. Annis, God only knows what he was going to do. When he called a play, uh, you'd look him and say, are you crazy? You know, never mind. Do what I tell you. And he scared the pants off me one day. It's third down, and he's and we're on our one-yard line. It's third down, and he's calling for a pass play to me. I says, are you nuts? It's third down. You're going to leave the ball here for the other team for... He says, it'll work. And I, I said, okay. So I took off down the field, and it was a long pass of maybe 40 or 50 yards, eh? And all the time I can see that ball in the air, my hands are shaking. I said, I better not drop this. And fortunately, it stuck to my hands, and we got out of the... But Annis was a gambler, and, and uh, I mean, in, in the sports. And Lou Heyman, the coach, used to get mad at him for it. But... Annis always had the answer, but it worked, Lou. <laughs> I learned two things in coaching. If you want to be successful in coaching, number one, you got to be a credit to your convictions, and number two, try to keep a low profile. I didn't know how to keep a low profile. I had a lot of confidence and broke a lot of rules and did a lot of things and was nicknamed Leo the Lip and all these kind of different situations. And But when I went with the Toronto Argonauts, I've never been a kind of, I, I hate a guy that pops off and that does the kind of things that I did. But it was, a, I had to do this in order to bring about a situation with the Toronto Argonauts that didn't exist in the past. And we started that way. Blackie Johnson, as you know, would come in and uh, talk to me uh, from time to time and and say, uh, Coach, do we have a crisis today? And I'd say, no, but we're going to create one. And I knew that the media loves stories, and, and they love controversy, and, and so I always look for a controversial edge on everything, and, uh, and I think as a result, uh, I had a pretty good rapport with the media, and uh, uh, again, I'll say, though, that when you win, everything is beautiful, and when you win, they start sus suspecting you. You know, we went from 13,000 tickets to 31,000 season tickets in, in, in a matter of three or four years. We became probably the most looked at team in the history of the Canadian Football League at that time. And those were the good times. The black quarterback issue during my era was very big. Um, I... Um, had an opportunity, as I said before, I was recruited by a lot of schools in the South. Um, and one school in particular, Alabama, recruited me very hard. And I had a meeting with Coach Bear Bryant. And to this day, I, I respect him very much for what he did because he didn't have to do that. He, Coach Bryant could have told me anything. He could have told me, son, if you come to Alabama, you can play quarterback and, uh, and, and we'll be glad to have you. And then when I got there, it changed his mind, and who are they going to believe, a 17-year-old kid from Huntsville, Alabama, or the legendary Bear Bryant? But he didn't do that. He took me aside, and he said, Condridge, we really want you to come here, but I don't think we're ready for a black quarterback at the University of Alabama. So if you come here, you will not be able to play quarterback. 
And he told me. So at least I knew what I was dealing with. At that particular time, unfortunately, that was kind of the stereotype that, uh, you know, black kids could not be leaders. They could not think, make decisions, do all those type of things. And, and we were good athletes. So sometimes we got penalized for being good athletes where they put us at the skill positions like defensive back and receiver and places where your skills became uh, an asset to you. But as you look today, you need a great athlete to play the quarterback position. And I think that same thing was true back then. They just didn't know it. Going to Tennessee, one of Bear Bryant's former players, Bill Battle, who was my coach, said to me, Counter, if you're the best quarterback on the field, you can play quarterback at Tennessee. And that really made the decision for me because I wanted to play quarterback. And it was an issue, and it was something. I, I was the first black quarterback in the Southeastern Conference. Uh, and in 1971, so that would have been 1972, you know, that's – I thought that was a big deal. I never thought of myself as a pioneer or – somebody, um, you know, like Martin Luther King that I was walking around paving the way. I just wanted to play football, and I had about 11 other guys on that other side of the ball that I needed to worry about. And I, it was a big media deal for a year, and after that it kind of died down. But when I came to Canada, I found out where all the black quarterbacks were. <laughs> I mean, Jimmy Jones, Chuck Ely, and I ended up, uh, let's see, J.C. Watts. Um, a lot of us were here. If you're that successful as a quarterback, you should be able to play the game, but he wasn't given that opportunity in, in the United States. So I had tremendous amount of respect for those guys that uh, they didn't give up. They came up here and, and they made a career for themselves and long careers. And I always felt like if things didn't work out for me in the National Football League, then I knew I had somewhere else I could go where I'd be wanted. It, it was not an issue in Canada. Uh, you could either play or you couldn't. Uh, the Argonauts, uh, no doubt about it, they, they had done everything bad in all these years, and suddenly uh, Leo got the team, and he turned it around. Unfortunately for Leo is he happened to go against Ottawa, which in those two years had an absolutely wonderful football team, quarterbacked by Russ Jackson. He had Ronnie Stewart and uh, Whit Tucker and uh, Dave Talon and... You know, and they, they, they were one of the best teams that uh, has ever, I think, that's ever been on the field in Canadian football. And the Argonauts, unfortunately, were never able to beat them in the playoffs, though they came close the famous year where Leo said that it would take an act of God to beat them. This was 69. We had a quarterback club that uh, there'd be a couple hundred people in uh, every week and another couple hundred on the street trying to get in. And uh, uh, at this quarterback uh, uh, they asked me uh, what I felt about the following game because we'd just beaten Ottawa by eight points in the first playoff game and when we had to go over there and, and finish it up and, and to, in order to, to win the series. And uh, when somebody asked me if, uh, if we thought uh, we could win that football game, my first reflection was uh, only an act of God can stop us. And I never knew the proportion that it would get to because uh, Frank Clare, uh, I think bought every newspaper in Ottawa and put it on the dressing room and and that has haunted me uh, all through my football career that statement only an act of God but uh, I was really just saying that uh, if the weather was good we'd be okay. I knew we were in trouble when looking out from the press box just before the game started there was Russ Jackson walking on the water of the Rideau Canal. The field was just solid ice we got trounced. Be, uh, Ottawa had, for some reason, come up with the idea of broomball shoes, and we were trying to w wear anything we could, and I think I had a minus two yards. I should have had my uniform on backwards instead of forward. would look like I was gaining yards instead of losing, but uh, it was so slippery. It was just incredible. It was an act of God because there was ice on the field. They come up with broomball shoes, and uh, which was very smart on their part, and then uh, I think Ronnie Stewart ran for about four and a half miles that afternoon without falling down, and we were slipping and sliding and ended up by getting beat, I guess, by about 20 points. And so uh, the only thing that uh, was a reflection as far as the game was concerned was my big mouth saying that only an act of God can beat us. Now, if you wonder why sometimes I talk... Uh, 
with a lisp or something wrong. So I got, this is the helmet we wore in our day. And uh, um, it was, un I don't know, I look at that and I, I say, how did we take so many hits and big hits with our head and not all wind up in the funny house? But uh, we, we didn't, uh, you learned how to tackle differently. We didn't go in head on. You were always on a slant. And that's the only thing that saved uh, the linebackers and all that. Uh, but look, you can see how that little flimsy little cheap things they are. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I played uh, pro lacrosse, no helmet. I played uh, hockey semi-pro, no helmet. Uh, I, 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 uh, played, I played a lot of my sports with no helmet and never got uh, seriously hurt. Don Matthews, uh, boy, he, he, he was enjoyable to play for. I just, I, I love the man. Um, I misunderstood him before I played for him. If you don't play for Don Matthews, you look at him as a cocky, arrogant guy that wants things his way or, or what. And, and a lot of people, I think, are jealous because he's had a lot of success. That they look at Don and they kind of, I don't know, he carries himself a certain way or something. And he would do anything in the world for his players. The guys on his team, he wants to put you, he, he's got a real, he has a real knack for getting the people he wants uh, and putting a winning team together and letting the players play. In 1990, when he came in as our head coach, he made the decision that I was going to be an every down back rather than a returner. And that year I went on to be the MVP in the league. In 1996, he came back and he decided that I wasn't any longer going to be a running back. I was going to be a receiver. That year, I caught 116 passes and, and broke the reception records for the Toronto Argonauts. He can recognize your strengths and weaknesses very quickly, and everybody has them. And somehow, Don Matthews will never put you in your weakness on the field. And that's not easy because there are 12 guys on the field that all have different types of weaknesses and he can find a way to hide them all. He found a way to get the absolute best out of me. He knew how to use me, understood how to use me and I think that is one of his greatest attributes is he understands how to make people successful. He also challenges them to get to that point. Playing against guys like Condridge Holloway, any of these guys that were like scat backs, they were magicians back there. Honestly, God, they were Houdini. If you missed them the first time, we used to say, just stay there. Just get up and get prepared because he'll going to be back in a second or two because that's how fast he was all over the field buying time. In 1982, a lot of times I, my memory is not that well when we lose to the Argos, but no, Conrad uh, Holloway. Very, very tough quarterback. I remember uh, having a, a shot on him. It was it's true what they say a lot of times when quarterbacks have eyes in the back of their head. I mean, I, I had it's uh, it's like a kill shot, a perfect shot for a D lineman, a defensive end coming free around the corner, and the quarterback has his back to you. He's he's looking down the field, and he has a ball up, and you said this is it, this is the shot that I'm going to cause him to fumble, and it's going to be a great sack. And I just, I just knew I had him. I was coming full speed, untouched. And when I went to wrap around, just like my technique, you know, go put my helmet in his back and wrap around, he ducked. And I just went over top. And it's the most embarrassing thing for a D lineman to miss a sack like that. I missed a few in my lifetime, but I've been able to get quite a few. But that was a, that was a time that I remember him. He's very uh, uh, slippery that way. When people talk about the different eras uh, that I've been involved with, uh, the, the first one that comes to mind is the McNall, Gretzky, Candy era. And when you describe that area, that era of time, um, 
I think the first thing that comes to mind is Showtime, uh, Rocky Dishmail, Coming to Time, the, blue, the, the Blues Brothers. So there, there are a lot of very fond memories about that time. Maybe my fondest memory is, is that of John Candy. I think John Candy symbolizes what is the Toronto Argonauts, what is Canadian football. He's a, he's a, a man that was so proud of his Canadian heritage, right? Believe so much in Canadian culture and Canadian traditions, right? But not only that, he had grown to great stature, right? But at the same time, right, treated everyone like they were special. He treated everyone as, as if they were more special, more significant than he was, right? He was a person that never outgrew, right, who he was. Right? He was proud to be Canadian. He was proud to be a human being, a simple human being who loved humanity, who every time he spoke to you, he engaged you in such a way that you thought you were the most significant, the most special person on the face of the earth. And it didn't matter if Wayne Gretzky was standing on this side and a movie star was standing on the other side. When he talked to you for those 20 seconds or 20 minutes, whatever time you required, not he required, he gave you his undivided attention. Another story that's interesting is, I believe, in either 96 or 97, when the Toronto Argonauts won the cup, Mike Vanderjack took it to a, uh, a bar in Oakville, in his hometown of Oakville. And he uh, let the patrons of the bar get their picture taken with it, drink with it. Um, somebody stole it, and he lost it. He didn't know what to do, so he, it went, he had to file a missing, uh, I'm, I'm a missing person's uh, paper, but it was stolen, so he had to go to the police and, and tell them what happened. What had happened was somebody dared a, a college student to steal it, and uh, so this college student stole it. Not only did he steal it, but to prove to the person who dared him, he put the gray cup on that person's kitchen table so that when that person came back from the bar that night, what did they see when they flipped the kitchen night on? But the, the gray cup sitting there because the, the person wanted to, to show that, look, at, you, know, you dared me to steal it, so I stole it. Meanwhile, Vanderjack, is, is, uh, he's, he's freaking because all of a sudden he's lost the gray cup. They returned it, and uh, he, uh, you know, he, he got it back, and he was very, very relieved to get it back. When the West came, it was like something else was born that you knew nothing about. And uh, I remember one night, uh, we were training for the, uh, the Grey Cup at the time, and Winnipeg were training uh, one of the colleges that are down around Guelph or something, and there was a guy came in out of the dark. We always trained at night, eh? And uh, this guy came out of the crowd, and he said to Lou Heyman, Lou, there's a guy over there in the sidelines and he's writing down all your plays. And Lou says, just a minute. And Lou leaves and he comes back in a minute. He says, here's a book on all my plays. I've spent six months trying to teach my team what they are, he says, and they haven't got it. Maybe it'll confuse Winnipeg too. Here, take the book. And that was it. I chased John Matthews around my first five, six, seven, seven years of my CFL career. I always was up against his masterminding defenses, his bastardized defenses, his fronts and his stunts and his aggressive style. I've always, you know, I watched him with his quarterbacks and uh, finally I had a chance to tee it up with him in 1990. And uh, Don sat me down in his office, I can remember this like it was yesterday, and he gave me the Don Matthews speech, as it's come to know him, you know. Matt, you know I am with my quarterbacks. I'm a player's coach, and I've got one quarterback, and you're him. And I want you to know that, no matter what situation, you're the guy. You know how I am, you're my guy. He says, if you throw five interceptions in one game, he says, don't come to the sidelines, hang your head, because you're going to get a chance to throw six. I'm going, yes, I like this guy. I feel good already. You know, he's like, it's okay to make a mistake out there. I'm not going to yank you. I'm a one-quarterback kind of guy. Well, first game of the season, we're playing Winnipeg. And, you know, I'm going to set the table here. You know, 
I could have thrown 12 that game if Winnipeg could catch. But I threw seven, and I came to the sidelines with a shitty grin on my face. And Don's looking at me, and I'm going, hey, Don, am I going to get a chance to throw eight? I got pulled finally after throwing seven. So I tested his theory. And, um, but he's true to his word. He's a one-quarterback kind of guy. I talked to some of my players now that come out, and they said, well, Coach Holloway, if, uh, if I don't make it in the NFL, uh, you think you can get me to, in, in the Canadian Football League? I said, son, let me ask you something. If you can't throw the out on this small field, what makes you think you can throw it on the larger field? He goes, what are you talking about? It feels a little wider, and it's a little longer. And if you're on the hash mark and throwing out to the field in Canada, that's a long ways. You better have a better arm than you had here. So don't think that because it's in Canada, it's an inferior game. That's not the case. And there's a lot of good football players in Canada, and, and don't ever degrade, degrade my, uh, my league and my, my livelihood. I, I, I get on a, a pedestal sometimes about that because these kids don't know. They just think that the CFL is a secondary place. I, I, kid, I tell them all the time, I say, guys, let me tell you something. There's a, any team in Canada will play the Miami Dolphins tomorrow if we can implement one rule, and it'll be fair. And they said, well, what do you mean? Do you want a longer field? you want the Canadian ball? What do you want? I said, we want the nationality rule. You let us do that, and we'll play Miami tomorrow. He says, what do you mean? Well, in my time, it's 1915. I said, well, we'll have 15 Americans. You have 15 Americans. We'll have 19 Canadians. You have 19 of any other nationality you can find other than American, and we'll play you. And they looked at me, and they go, well, where are we going to find them? I said, I don't know, but we find them in Canada. You find them, and we'll play you. And then they look at me, and they go, Is that, are those really the rules? I said, yeah. So it's a different game. And the, all the players are good, but we've got a nationality problem that we deal with. It's not a problem. It just makes the game better. So I'll get off my pedestal. Well, yeah, but we need more. Since 1873, the Toronto Argonauts have challenged for supremacy in Canadian football and have experienced the euphoria of capturing the Grey Cup 14 times. The Toronto Argonauts battled the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in the 1950 Grey Cup that became known as the Mud Bowl. Toronto quarterback Al Dekdebron called a perfect game despite the muddy conditions at Varsity Stadium. While Dak DeBron managed to keep a grip on the ball, Winnipeg quarterback Jack Jacobs was not as fortunate. The conditions forced the Bombers to abandon their passing game. In addition to providing the Argonauts with booming punts, Joe Crawl also made one of the biggest plays of the game when he converted a mishandled snap into a 15-yard gain. Crawl's dash set up the field goal, which vaulted the Argonauts to a 13 to nothing Break up victory. In 1952, the Toronto Argonauts challenged the Edmonton Eskimos for the Grey Cup at Far City Stadium. The Argonauts appeared to be headed for an easy victory, but the Eskimos made it difficult as Normie Kwong would score a touchdown in the third quarter. The star of the game was Toronto's Nobby Workowski. He ran for one touchdown and threw for another on the way to a 21-11 Grey Cup triumph that marked the end of a glorious era in Argonaut football. After losing to the Edmonton Eskimos in 1982, the Toronto Argonauts were back in 1983 to face the BC Lions under the dome at BC Play Stadium for the first Grey Cup game to be played indoors. Toronto quarterback Conrad Holloway struggled with the flu and a ruthless Lions defense. The Argo curse looked as though it was still in effect as BC took a 17-7 lead into halftime. In the second half, coach Bob Obilovich called on veteran Joe Barnes to take over for Holloway at the quarterback position. 
Barnes made the difference as he produced an 1817 comeback victory over the BC Lions for the Argonauts' first Grey Cup championship since 1952. The 1991 Grey Cup game featured the Toronto Argonauts and Calgary Stampeders at Winnipeg Stadium. The high-profile ownership team of Wayne Gretzky, John Candy and Bruce McNall assembled the Toronto football team that was a force in the CFL East. Matt Dunnigan, Pinball Clemens and the lightning-quick Rocket Ismail led a cavalcade of stars all the way to the national championship game. On Grey Cup Sunday, the Rocket took off with dazzling punt returns. Quarterback Matt Dunnigan played through intense pain despite a badly injured shoulder. Dunnigan's heroic effort paid off as the Toronto Argonauts celebrated a 36-21 Grey Cup victory over the Calgary Stampeders. The 1996 Grey Cup would see the Toronto Argonauts face the Edmonton Eskimos at Hamilton's Ivor Wynn Stadium. On the snow-covered field, the Argonauts and Eskimos entertained the entire nation with exciting football. Robert Drummond thundered down the gridiron for clutch yardage, and Jimmy the Jet Cunningham took flight on kick returns. Two of the biggest stars of the game for the Argonauts were Mike Vanderjack and Doug Flutie. Vanderjack didn't miss as he managed to boot five field goals. Flutie solidified his place amongst the best quarterbacks of all time as he ran the Argo offense with precision on the way to a 43-37 Grey Cup victory. At the 1997 Grey Cup, the Toronto Argonauts met the Saskatchewan Rough Riders before a sellout crowd at Edmonton's Commonwealth Stadium. The defending champion Argonauts were looking to repeat, and they would not disappoint. Adrian Smith set the field ablaze by scoring a thrilling touchdown on a punt return. Toronto quarterback Doug Flutie was elusive as he unleashed their powerful offense. The Rough Riders were overwhelmed by the Argonaut team. A second consecutive Grey Cup championship would be certain and the final result was a decisive 47-23 victory over the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. The Toronto Argonauts continue their quest for glory as future generations strive to become Grey Cup champions. Canadian football is a magic show. It is a game that has grabbed our nation by the heart. This is the story of CFL Traditions, a five-hour television special that showcases the history and heroes of Canadian football. Live the game's greatest moments through the eyes and hearts of its most celebrated legends. Now available on DVD and VHS, CFL Traditions is the ultimate collector's edition. Each of the nine franchises is featured in their own special team edition release. Nine teams, nine titles, available in stores everywhere. football is, is something I was brought up on. I love the game because it's quick. It, it has always allowed the quarterback to be able to run with the ball, and I thoroughly enjoyed that challenge. In the Canadian League, uh, no such thing as being a rookie. You, you, 
you're a contributor or you're not, or else you don't make it. The excitement in the game in a Canadian football game with the three downs, with the wider field, with the kick return, it may be the best game in the world to watch on television. It's so fast, it's so wide open, and it, I, I think it, it speaks to my personality. It's sort of a living on the edge type of football game. It's exciting. You're never out of a ball game in the Canadian Football League. And as a quarterback, that's all you want is a chance. You want to have the ball in your hands with one minute to play and give your team a chance to win the ball game. It was an opportunity that I was being given that I didn't see happening in my own country. And I really weighed the pros and cons of going to Canada or staying in the United States. And I chose to go to Canada because they were giving me a realistic opportunity to play the game that I love. I came up just with the attitude that I was going to learn about the CFL, put my best foot forward. Whatever it took, I was going to get the job done, and anything else was not acceptable. I wanted to come play, and in the NFL, they would have just used me for, you know, okay for this and for that. And in Edmonton, I knew I had a chance to do what I wanted to do and play the game. It put the fun back in football for me. It enabled me to go back out, just be an athlete, play football, and enjoy it. And I'll be forever grateful for that. The Canadian Football League is arguably the most significant cultural institution in the country as it relates to bringing cities across the country together. It's the one thing, the one professional sport that we have left that we can say is purely Canadian. It's the only one.